Welcome to Generations, a show which helps people 50 and better lead happy, healthy, and productive lives. And welcome as well to our new moderator, Nadia Giordana, from Woman Vision TV. Here's Nadia. Hello, and welcome to Generations. I'm Nadia Giordana. Co-hosting with me today are Diane Winkler. Welcome, Diane. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. And Stephen Dodds. Hi, Thank Stephen. You, Diane. It's good to be here. Mm -hmm. And Bill Klingbeil is our guest. He is an expert on roundabouts. Bill, why don't you tell us about what you do? Well, thank you for having me here, Nadia. So I am a roundabout design specialist, uh, civil engineer. That's my emphasis is in roundabout design. I also design uh, highways and other types of intersections to improve them for safety and capacity. So today I'm here uh, to talk mainly about roundabouts and how they work and what they are and uh, how to drive them. And in, in some aspects about seniors and how they respond to roundabouts. I noticed a couple of years ago when they first started popping up around the, the state that what is this strange new intersection? <laughs> Have you had some feedback from people about that? Uh, lots of feedback. So uh, yes, that is correct. They are, they are new. Uh, it's only been since about the late 90s, uh, mm -hmm. early 2000s that they started uh, becoming more common, becoming constructed in, in America. Uh, so it is relatively new and the education is limited on them. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, engineers have a, a job for them to do to help educate the folks uh, how to drive them if we're going to design and build them. Is there much uh, information out there for people to to get on these or where are they getting their education? How is the public learning about it? Uh, there's multiple sources. Uh, the Minnesota Department of Transportation and other uh, departments of transportation or local agencies have uh, information on their websites uh, that's accessible. Uh, there's information um, at uh, MnDOT itself if you go into mm -hmm. the building. Uh, there's outreach programs. Uh, we go head out to state fairs, the county fairs, uh, any, anything mm -hmm. we can do uh, to help. Uh, there's been articles in the newspaper. Um, uh, public meetings for these projects are held uh, when they're going to be constructed. So there's several meetings we'll have to open up to the public to come uh, learn more about them. But still, uh, it's still not enough and there's still a lot of questions and a, and a lot of work to do. Great. One of, one of the most uh, confusing things, obviously, is, as you said, people come across these newfangled inventions and wonder, how, how do I navigate this? What advice would you have for maybe someone who's not used to the stress sure. of navigating roundabouts? There are no signs on a roundabout that are unique. Uh, it's a, a yield sign at the, where you enter. Um, once you yield, you yield till you see a gap from cars circulating. Once there's a, a gap or open space there, then you enter the roundabout. There are one-way signs there telling you to go this way around the roundabout. Uh, so it's, it's nothing new for signing. Uh, it is a, an obstacle in the middle you have to go around, but uh, uh, that is uh, as simple as it can get, I guess, for driving them. You only have to look one direction if the vehicle's coming from your left and then uh, the speeds are slow, around uh, 20 miles an hour average, uh, going around the roundabout. So even though you're slowing down traffic, it actually improves people's journey time, doesn't it? Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, if you compare it to a signal, when, uh, especially at night when it's, uh, you're standing at a, sitting at a red light and there's no one around, uh, you're waiting there for quite a while. At a roundabout, uh, you just have to slow down if no one's around. You continue around the circle and uh, take the appropriate exit uh, you need to. Um, it's uh, more uh, every, if there's no circulating traffic, uh, you can get more traffic entering into the roundabout. There's just less wait time that way. So they work really well where there's a lot of left turns at intersections. Bill, so. could you please tell us about how the roundabout started and where it started? Uh, I'll be as quick as possible, but uh, you know, the U.S. actually started with circular intersections back when the cars were mm -hmm. invented and, and manufactured, uh, but they were the big rotaries. So if you go out east and you say, well, they're taking them all out, out east, why are we building them? Uh, they're larger rotaries. They have big sections where you can, cars can weave. Um, as uh, more and more people own cars and the volumes mm -hmm. increase, those rotaries started to break down. Uh, speeds increased and we saw crashes and a lot of uh, delay at those so they started signalizing them. Uh, so we made a decision then back around the 30s to go with signals 
Uh, Europe, on the other hand, specifically the UK, decided to take that technology. They, they made a couple of major changes. They made the circle smaller to slow the speeds down, and they yielded at the entry rather than in the circle. The old rotaries, you would yield in the circle, and when uh, traffic was heavy, they would back up and, and lock up. Uh, um, so those two rule changes made a big difference with the roundabouts, and then since the late 90s, uh, early 2000s, we've been kind of taking that, using that over here now uh, at our intersections. Are there some safety statistics on these rotaries? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so engineers use them for a reason, not to confuse people, but uh, they reduce the amount of what we call conflict points, the amount of ways you can get in an accident at an intersection. Uh, a standard intersection has 32 ways you can crash, a roundabout uh, has eight. So the safety statistics that come out of that are um, a 90 percent reduction in fatal crashes uh, by having si low speed side swipes rather than a high speed uh, T-bone uh, crash. We have a 75% reduction in injury crashes um, and a 40% reduction of total crashes at the intersection. Wow. So they are safer. And, you know, for some people, they're unfamiliar, but they're actually safer than those four-way stops that you come to. All right. That's good to know. Uh, the Federal Highway Administration actually considers it a safety device, and so federal funding is available for those uh, intersections that see high crashes. They'll help fund roundabouts at those intersections. Wonderful. Just wonderful. Is there any problem with your roundabouts, Bill, with people with different nationalities and speech? Have you ever had any that would have a hard time interpreting your roundabout? Uh, well, hopefully everyone with a driver's license in the U.S. <laughs> understands the, the U.S. signs on the road because, oh. like I said, those were those They're are very simple. Are the are they? simple signs? So you can They're see standard. Them They're, we use them all over. Yield signs and one ways, and those are the signs that we use at roundabouts. So yeah, no not, worse than a normal intersection in the normal interpretation. Right. Very okay. good. Thank you. It's not. It's not just uh, stateside because I was over in Europe quite mm -hmm. recently, and the okay. signs are very, very similar. Even though the the wording underneath might be different, but they mean exactly the same thing, and it's exactly. almost. It's, it's a universal thing, okay. as, as Bill said. Are we so frightened as seniors to try anything like that? And this is why I feel that this is so important to all the people to get to know how safe they are. And so when you're listening to a group of people discussing the roundabouts, we feel that there is hope. <laughs> <laughs> They're different to yes. the seniors. They're not used to navigating the roundabouts. And let's say you get a senior that's coming in from uh, the rural areas. It's a whole new thing for them, but it's mainly just navigation. It's a little bit different, but as long as it's safer, they should be able to manage that. If a mistake is made at a roundabout and someone ends up going the wrong way, they're making a mistake at 15 or 20 miles an hour. Oh, and when you see someone so confused, bad. they're barely moving. and. Uh, they, there's videos out there of people going the wrong way, and what you see is people going come around. Just, we'll, yeah, we'll just yield, <laughs> and this person many. will figure <laughs> it out and usually just take the first exit and leave. But it's a, a low speed mistake rather than running a red light at a high speed intersection. Is it easier on your gas tank? Uh, part of the benefits of roundabouts are a, a reduction in the amount of. of fuel used, so that's mm -hmm. one of the calculations we consider over a 24-hour period. Yeah. Okay. Um, so like I mentioned, the, the stopping at a red light at night when no one's around at a roundabout, you just keep going. Keep on going. So, so therefore you, you use less fuel because you, your journey time is shorter. And it also must help the um, air as far as what? idling time idling and air time, quality. Air quality, yeah. right? Yes. That is right. Okay. I noticed something yesterday. I was at a roundabout, and that whole center section, it almost looked like there was another lane, and there wasn't really a curb to go up to it. And I thought to myself, is that an extra lane, or is that kind of an overflow thing that uh, for if your cars get to it, What is the purpose of that? That is called a truck apron. So make it smaller for the cars, but that concrete, little short raised concrete mm -hmm. medium is for the trailer of the truck to ride on when they go around the roundabout. Ah, so you make it uncomfortable for cars to drive on there, but you accommodate that truck trailer so you can get those large vehicles through the mm -hmm. roundabout. Okay, that's why it's not impossible to get up on it. It's kind of a gradual curb, not mm -hmm. a normal curb. I wondered what that was. Yeah, you're not meant to drive on it, but a lot of people do. Yeah, oh. yeah I think I saw that. Okay.
Okay. It's good. a challenge for the engineers to get the curb the right slope so cars <laughs> don't drive over it, but truck tray wheels get up there. So. Oh, I can imagine. Any words of advice for seniors? <laughs> Uh, don't fear the roundabouts. So around the country, I've engaged uh, uh, groups that have been advocates for, senior groups that have actually been advocates for roundabouts mm -hmm. because it's a simplified decision making where you only have to look one direction. Uh, you're slowing down, everything's happening at 20 miles an hour, not 50. And uh, so those are benefits that, that are out there for them. Um, and that it's, it's just uh, follow the signs and uh, if you have any questions, there's always uh, websites uh, mm -hmm. and other resources out there to get more information on them. Bill, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? How you got involved in all this wonderful work? Uh, well, uh, I'm a public servant by just by nature. I served in the Air Force and after that I went into mm -hmm. civil engineering because it, it seemed like the most, uh, I could do the most good for the public. Okay. Um, and learning about roundabouts and the amount of lives they could save at intersections really appealed to me that I could do something good for society and give back. So that's okay. kind of how I got into it and I've been doing it for just the roundabouts for about 10 years and being a civil engineer for about 15. And you work for a company? Uh, Kimley Horn and Associates. Uh, our local office is in St. Paul, right on University and 280, mm -hmm. and uh, they're a national firm. Mm -hmm. And in his spare time, they have four boys that all play hockey. And someday we'll all be reading about these boys, and Dad is a coach. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. I hope so. <laughs> That'll be fun. That'll be fun. Well, back to roundabouts too. Now, are there are they popping up more? Is are there more planned to, to show up? How is that being determined? Where they're going to be and how many? Uh, at every intersection, um, MnDOT will consider a roundabout. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not it, it's a process you go through. What's the best uh, use of a, a tool at an intersection? So a roundabout's not a silver bullet. It's not going to be everywhere. Mm -hmm. But uh, so we do planning where, where they would work the best. Uh, will it improve safety or capacity? Is there right away? Um, are the grades right? So there's a lot of factors we consider. So, but they are more common. They're always considered. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you'll see more and more of them as time moves on. So how long does the entire process take from the idea of replacing a regular four-way intersection with a roundabout? Uh, it can vary. Funding has a lot to do with it. So if funding is in place, it could be uh, uh, one to two years before construction starts. Uh, just to get funding in place, that could be several more years. And if it's tied to a really big project, you could take a decade. So it, it, that's kind of the, the scope of how long it could take. So if it, if it happens in kind of a business arena, is, is there some consultation given with the businesses regarding the cost of it? Yes. Uh, there's a lot of coordination that goes into any project and especially a roundabout one where all the stakeholders are contacted and uh, you run through a process with them to um, a very transparent process and bring them along with the decision making that's that's done developing a project so they are well informed um, these businesses uh, they have con conceptions too of, of roundabouts that uh, they're bad for business or good for business so really have to coordinate with them to get their uh, consent well, Bill, thank you so much for coming here and sharing this information about roundabouts. We're running out of time. And we have coming up next Joan Kennedy, a 92-year-old author and public speaker. In fact, she bills herself as the oldest female motivational speaker in the country.